going to show you a series of pictures. What do you think she's looking at? Or her? These pictures are from Iran, by the way. Or them, just little children. Or how about her? Let's zoom out. What do you think they're looking at? Take a look at the expressions on their faces. The widened eyes. The look of concern. Nervousness. Even people crying. What could be causing this unease in these people? Unfortunately, this is a typical day in Iran. This is a typical sight in Iran. These are the types of images that people in Iran are exposed to very commonly. People, children, adults. You could just be walking around in the main central square in Tehran, and you could just be exposed to this. You can open your window and be exposed to this. This is Ali Reza Mullah Sultani. He was executed in public. He was a teenager when he was charged with murder. He insists he was innocent. Despite his insistence, he was executed in 2011. Ali Reza Mullah Sultani was only 17 years old when he was executed. But the regime in Iran insists he was 18. Let's take a closer look. This is the increasing trend in executions in Iran. These numbers are the official numbers. These are the numbers that the regime in Iran actually publishes and is proud of in the media. You see, while most countries around the world have taken steps to abolish the death penalty, some countries still use capital punishment as a means to counter crime. On the bright side, even though the death penalty is still exists as a form of punishment, most countries don't use it. But of course, there are countries that do. I have to name some of them, because it's very important. It's not limited to these, but China, Iran, Yemen, North Korea, and the United States of America. Iran is home to the most executions per capita in the world, while China is home to the most executions. As I said, these are the confirmed official executions, the executions that the UN and human rights organizations use. And as you can see, in 2009, when the popular Iranian uprising began, you can see a spike in the executions. These are the reported uh, executions we get from human rights activists, from inside the prisons, from our sources inside. As you can see in 2012, including the unconfirmed or reported executions, it's more, more than 800. So if you average that out, you're looking about over two executions every day in Iran. Executions, according to human rights activists, according to our analysis, Executions is the main instrument that the regime in Iran uses to spread fear among civil society. As the Iranian regime loses its popular support, as we, can, as we saw after 2009, it will feel more threatened from the people and thus will increase the number of executions. Most people in Iran who are executed, their trial is conducted behind closed doors. They're not uh, they're not given a lawyer, they have no access to a lawyer. Most often, their charges aren't even uh, published. And we're not really sure why they were executed. But let's look, take a closer look at who is being executed. Who is so dangerous, such a threat to, I guess, I guess to the regime in Iran, that they must be executed? This is Mohammad Ali Haj Aghai. He was arrested in September 2009, after the, uh, the, the uprising. He was charged with moharebe. Moharebe is an Arabic term. It means waging war against God. He's a mohareb, an enemy of God. Muhammad Ali Hajagai, according to his prison mates, was one of the kindest men in prison. He used to clean the toilets when other prisoners wouldn't do it. Just, he didn't want the young people, the students, the political prisoners, the students to do it. 
Muhammad Ali Hajagai was accused of being a supporter of the Mojahedina Khalq organization of Iran, of being a supporter of them. He was executed along with Jafar Kazemi in January 2011. They were tortured to confess, to give televised confessions, and they refused to cooperate. This is Shirin Alam Huli. She was around my, I'm 30 right now, and she was uh, executed May 9th, 2010, along with four other political prisoners, including a Kurdish teacher by the name of Farzad Kamangar. She's Kurdish as well. She was around my age when she was executed. She uh, was charged with uh, being a member of PJAK, a Kurdish opposition group. Again, her charge is Moharebe. She didn't, before she uh, was sent to the gallows, she, she pleaded, she pleaded to, to talk to her mom one last time, and they didn't let her. These are five Ahwazi Arab activists who are on death row right now, and they need your voices. They are in imminent danger of execution. Ethnic minorities in Iran are the most vulnerable to executions. Baluchis, Arabs, Azaris, and the list goes on. However, these political executions I just mentioned, I just use those two as examples. There's much more, of course. But in 2012, political executions for the charge of Moharebe only made up 2% of the executions. And of course, for the regime in Iran, there, there's more liability by executing political prisoners. So they don't do it as often. There's more repercussions with each execution. But they do just enough to get away with it. And the world is silent. However, 70 to 80% of all executions carried out in Iran are for drug-related charges. You see, the Iranian regime, and I don't use the word Iran, because the Iran is the people as well. So I specifically say the regime in Iran, and I urge media to do that as well. The Iranian regime's war on drugs is supported by the United Nations Office on the Drugs and Crime. The United Nations is very active in giving millions of dollars annually to the regime in Iran to make sure that they're fighting against the war on drugs. The situation is very complicated, and I don't want to get into it, but there's lots of readings on it online. Now, the UN has good intentions. They want to keep the drugs from coming into Europe. So what they do is that they give money to the regime to make sure that you know, the border, uh, they're controlling the borders, Afghanistan, Pakistan borders, not allowing the drugs being transited into Iran and taken into the Persian Gulf in Europe. And, uh, and at the same time, they, they fund rehabilitation and crimes and punishment. The irony of this all is the people, member countries, who are giving money to this program for Iran are democratic countries countries that don't have the death penalty. And Norway is the major funder of this program. However, Norway says that they do not fund the crime and punishment section. That's fine. However, there's no effective monitoring system in Iran, so you really don't know where the money is being used. But even if you do, the point is, when you are giving money to the regime in Iran to fight the war on drugs. And part of the regime's war on drugs is executing people. Then, directly or indirectly, you are giving them legitimacy. You're giving executions legitimacy. You're providing political legitimacy. Donor countries should not contribute to executions. Just recently, Denmark cut their funding for the same reason. And we urge donor countries not to not give funding, because rehabilitation is important, but make your funding conditional. As long as the regime is executing for, execu um, sorry, is executing for drug-related charges, then please don't give them money. Take a stance if you are against executions. This is Mohammad La Javad Larijani. He was the Iran's High Council for Human Rights. So I just want to show you the justification so he says, we cannot win this war alone. If Europe is interested in the prevention of the trafficking of drugs, then it should participate in this war. Well, Europe is happy because the drugs are being kept out of their country, and everyone is turning a blind eye 
to the victims, the Iranian people, the 70 million Iranian people. Because it's not, the victims are not only the people being executed, the victims are those who are being exposed to the executions as well. So this is what he says to Europe. This is how he gets them to stay on his side. But what does the regime in Iran say to the people? Because the regime in Iran cannot say, well, we're cooperating with the West and use that as a, a source of pride because, I mean, they pride in their anti-Western rhetoric, of course. So what do they say to justify cooperating with the UN and Europe? It is our Islamic duty to fight the war on drugs. So who are these... Um, drug lords that the regime is executing. I mean, they must be really dangerous people. Well, this is Leila Hayati. Leila was uh, very, she was around my age as well when she was executed. She wasn't a drug lord. She's part of the low income of Iran. She, was, uh, she basically introduced someone to a drug dealer and uh, they arrested her for that. And then later on, they, they charged her with possession of seven kilograms of drugs. And then she was executed. There are main, many Leila Hayatis out there. I want to just tell you a little bit more. There's Huria Sabahi. We don't have pictures of them. She's the only picture we have, so she will be the symbol for the others. There's Huria Sabahi. She's th she was 35. She was a single mother of five children. One of her children has special needs. And then there's Rogie Khalaji, she was 32, and she was a single mother of a 12-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. Huria's family didn't even have money to pay for her funeral. Are these the types of drug lords that are so dangerous that they must be executed? So as you can see, it's not necessarily about executing these people because they're a danger to society. There must be something more to it. And human rights have, activists have concluded that these people are being executed to spread fear among civil society. This is Zahra Bahrami. She's an Iranian Dutch citizen. She came to visit Iran in um, around, the around the time of the uprising, in 2009. She was political. She had a blog. She was critical of the regime in Iran. She was arrested, charged with Moharebe, and then later on, Magically, a new case file was opened for her, and she was, uh, she was executed for drug trafficking. These are the people that the Iranian regime is afraid of. These are the people that the, the reason why the Iranian regime is executing, to keep them silent. By executing, the Iranian regime is displaying a harder and stronger image to civil society. The regime aims to seem more powerful than it is in order to prevent dissent among civil society. By conducting executions, the regime is telling people they are powerless and that efforts to change the regime is useless. We're here to talk about fear, right? Well, based on what I said, it seems like the regime is the most fearful. And the regime is most fearful of these people right here. And that's why they execute. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.